Well, you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. We begin a study of the Acts of the Apostles and, and our study. It's, it's a book of action. It's the book that deals with the history of the church. In fact, it covers the first 30 years of the church. A lot of times people say, well, the book of Acts, that's the story of the, of the, of the church. It's actually the first 30 years. It's the, it starts with the ascension of Jesus Christ as he goes back into heaven and then ends with Paul being in prison in Rome. And as we begin, there's so much in this book, and you know it's it's uh, it's it's long, and so we'll it'll, it'll take us a while to go through it. Uh, it's it's full of great things. Think about this. It's full of great people. Think of people like apostles, like Peter and Paul. They're going to stand out in this book. Peter in the first part of the book, Paul in the second part of the book. And then there's great believers like like a man by the name of Barnabas. And, he, he, you know, people just go, Barnabas, who's that? But he's, his name really means the son of, of, of encouragement. And we'll see what he did. And Timothy and Silas and, and a woman by the name of Lydia. And then we see great events like Pentecost, the beginning of the church, the stoning of Stephen, the salvation and testimony of Paul, this big shipwreck, the spread of the message of Jesus Christ going to all the known world. There's so much, and what we'll do is we always do. We'll go verse by verse, passage by passage, and we'll try to make application as we go through. This book is the beginning of the church, and we can be encouraged because we think about it. We're a new church, and we have the great privilege of starting right here and taking this message in this community and throughout the whole world. May we have a great time as we study through the, the book of Acts. You know, there. If you if you turn on the television, as you know, there are literally hundreds of TV channels. I mean, they're everywhere. And and whether you've got the dish or cable or whatever it is, it's got all kind of things there. I think one of the most popular channels that people talk to me all the time about is the History Channel. Now, I never was much into to to history, especially growing up. But after I became a Christian, I really got into it. But on the History Channel, there's documentaries and movies. And just recently, they had the story of the Bible, that uh, it, it, 10 million people. Uh, on Sunday nights, a week watched that. As I said, growing up, I really wasn't much into history. I kind of was thinking more about sports when I was sitting in class rather than history. But anyway, I, I never realized how important history was until I started actually studying the Bible. And this morning, we're actually going to start a history book. And if you think it's going to be boring, it will never be boring. The, the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharp than a two-edged sword, pierced as far as the vision of the soul and spirit. It's going to be amazing study. We're going to look at what the Bible records is about the first 30 years of the history of the church. And there, there's so much there. Let's, let's talk about how it fits together. When you think about the New Testament, the New Testament can be divided into three big sections. Some people just say Gospels, but I don't look at it that way. I look at that as history. I think the history books are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. Then the second section of the New Testament is what we call the epistles or the letters. There were the 13 letters that Paul wrote and then the letters by the other people like Peter and James and, and John and those others. And then the very last section is what we call the prophecy section, which is the book of the Revel of Revelation, the Revelation. So when you look at it, the book of Acts, which we're studying, fits in the history section of the New Testament. So we're going to be seeing that. We're looking at this. Trans by the way, it's a transition book. There are things that happen in the book of Acts that never happen again. Because you're moving, in a sense, you're starting with this, this God is bringing Jews and Gentiles together and putting them in one body, which he calls the church, and it's a whole new thing. As we look today, we're going to look at two different things. We're going to start with background. We'll get a little background of the book. That's how we do it when we start a new study. We always look at the background, and then we'll just actually get to verses 1 and 2. We're just going to touch on them because next week we'll start back over and go a little further. We'll start back at verse 1 again. Let's get some background. And by the way, it, you should hopefully as you came in, you got this card. If you didn't get the card, they're on the tables. You can pick them up as you go. On one side of the card, it says Book of Acts, and it has the author and the date and the theme and the key verses and key events, and it gives you a little bit about the book of Acts. That's on one side. On the other side is actually an outline of the book of Acts so that as you study this book yourself, now we're going to be studying it week after week after week, but as you study it yourself, you'll be able to see, okay, where am I in the book of Acts? How does this fit? How do all these things fit together? And so it's really amazing. Let's start with background. Let's do that. And the title, of course, is Acts. And it's really not Acts. The, the original title was the Acts of the Apostles. Some places you'll even find something called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. So I, my Bible just says the Acts of the Apostles. And so what we're thinking about here is we're seeing the actions, because that's what it is. What did these men who were chosen by Jesus Christ, called apostles, and the word apostle means one sent forth with authority, what did these men do after Jesus left? You remember, we just got through seeing the Gospel of John, and we saw in the upper room where Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You know, I'm leaving. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He told him he was leaving, and then someday he'd come back. 
Well, they've been with him, and they, now he's left. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? What if it was us? What if we had just been with Jesus, and he leaves, and then we look at each other and go, well, what, are we, what are we supposed to do, right? Well, guess what? It is us. It's some years later, but we're looking at each other saying, okay, what has he got for us to do? What are we supposed to do? So the title is Acts, and, 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 and we say, okay, Acts of the Apostles, and so we think, okay, it's going to be about the apostles, but the truth is this. It actually narrows down to two key people, Peter and Paul. And that's who are the, the ones that we're going to see the most. Now, there are going to be other people mentioned. There's going to be Philip and some other people in Barnabas and those guys. But in reality, it's going to center on Peter, who's going to stand up on the day of Pentecost. That's Acts chapter 2. He's going to be the leader. And then we're going to see later on, Paul moves to the front, and we're going to see Paul. Paul's other name was Saul, and we'll talk more about him in just a minute. Acts is the acts of the Holy Spirit as he used different people to take the message of Jesus Christ into this world. All of us in this room who know Jesus Christ as Savior, we have the Holy Spirit, and we get to do the same thing. The author, of course, is Luke. He is Luke the physician, and, and, and uh, he, he continues the work that he started. If you read Acts chapter 1, and we'll get to it in just a minute, but he's writing to a guy named Theophilus, and we'll talk more about that in a second, and he's saying, now, I started writing about Jesus, what all he began to do and say, and now he's continuing on. So what Luke is doing is writing a sequel. He started writing his book called, we call it the Gospel of Luke. It's about the life of Christ on the earth, selected events of what Jesus did when he was on the earth. And now he's writing a second book, and we call it the Acts of the Apostles. And he's going to say, here's what Jesus kept doing after he left. Because he's talking about how, how God used these men to take the message of Jesus Christ. These people, not just men. And we see selected events. The date. When was this thing written? Well, most believe Acts was written around 60 to 63 AD. Now, think about this. Jesus, let's just say that Jesus, and we know that the, the dating is off just a little bit, but Jesus probably around 30 to 33 AD did his ministry and was probably killed around 33, maybe 34, but 33, 32, 34, somewhere in there. Uh, most say 33. Well, this book covers starting right there and goes up about 30 years till about 62, 63 A.D. And we find that it goes from the time Jesus left the earth until Paul is in prison in Rome. That's how we know the date. Because Paul's in prison in Rome in the 60s. And what we don't get, we know that that's where it stops. And so we know it covers that time period because things like the destruction of the temple, that was in A.D. 70. And the the events that happened at Masada in A.D. 73, that's not recorded in here. The death of Paul is not recorded in here. The death of Peter is not recorded in here. Now, that happened in around 67 A.D. So he stops the book. Luke stops the book when Paul is in prison in Rome. And, and there's, so there's so many things, but we'll, we'll see those first 30 years. There's a key verse, and the key verse is Acts 1.8. And that is the key to the whole book on how things fit together. Notice Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. I want you to see something that the whole book of Acts divides based on this one verse. Look at this. Acts 1 through 7 is the spread of the message in Jerusalem. Acts 8 through 12 is the spread of the message in Judea and Samaria. And Acts chapters 13 through 28 is the spread of the message throughout the earth. So he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Acts chapters 1 through 7, Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 through 12, and to the remotest part of the earth, to the end of the earth, that's 13 through 28. So the whole book breaks down based on this, chat, on this verse that kind of puts the book together for us. The book is special because it's a bridge, a bridge between the Gospels, which is the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the letters. See, think about it. If you didn't have the book of Acts, you would have information about Jesus. Jesus would, would be at the very end, and then all of a sudden you'd have these letters written to churches. And you'd go, how did these churches get here? And well, how did this work? And so what we find is a bridge. This book is going to show us how the church began, how these churches began, how the message was spread. I want you to think about how this is a bridge. Look at this. Matthew ends with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts begins with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark ends with the ascension of Jesus Christ. Acts begins with the ascension of Jesus Christ. 
Luke ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts begins with the coming promise of the Holy Spirit. John ends with the teaching about the return of Jesus Christ at his second coming. Acts begins with the information about his return and the second coming. So actually, Acts puts it all together as it begins. It shows us the trials, the persecutions, the the triumphs of the early church, the love, the joy, the the spreading of the message. Let me show you some events, okay? Because I get excited about the book, and I want you to do this. I want you to think about this. This this is even though it's history, we're going to read this, and it's as if we were there, right? We did that when we looked at the life of Christ. We, you know, we looked at times where we say, well, what if we were in the upper room? What if we were there when he was crucified? What if we were there when he was talking to those Pharisees and those kind of things? Well, as we go through some of these events, we're going to see some incredible things. Let me show you something. We're going to see the ascension of Christ. It, it's if we, what if we were there? Jesus talks to his men, and we're going to see it right as he gets through talking to them. Suddenly, he just goes off the face of the earth and goes up into the clouds, and they watch him go. Two angels come and say, what are you all looking up there for? Well, they said, well, Jesus just left. We're going to see the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, which is the beginning of the church and the Holy Spirit coming. It's an incredible event. We're going to see the early persecution of the apostles. Let me tell you, they got these guys, and they're standing out telling people about Jesus, and they come and arrest them and throw them in jail, and they beat them all up, and they call them, and they say, uh, you can no longer talk about Jesus. And they go, whether we should obey God or you, let's see, we're going to obey God. And they get beat up all the time, but they stand for Jesus Christ. The, the fourth thing we'll see is the death of Stephen. Here is a man who stood for Jesus Christ, gave the history of Israel. If you've ever said, you know, the Old Testament's big, well, all you have to do is go, go to Acts, and you will find the history of the nation of Israel when Philip tells uh, uh, what happened. And then we'll see, uh, excuse me, Stephen, and then we'll see the work of Philip who's an evangelist. And he goes all over. There's some incredible events. And then, to me, one of the most important events in the history of mankind, and that is the conversion of Saul, who is also called Paul. We call him Paul the Apostle. He was a man on the road to Damascus going to get and kill Christians. And he, Jesus Christ appears to him, and he changes that moment he believes in Jesus Christ as Savior and just as fired up as he was against Jesus Christ, he was fired up for Christ and he changed the world. He went on three missionary journeys. He ended up going to Rome. Incredible man. He's the one that took the, go, stay, stay right there. He's the one that took the message to the end of the earth and, and what we call the known world. So it's amazing. I love Paul. When I first started studying the Bible, uh, y'all know I trusted Christ when I was 19 but I didn't start growing until I was about 26, 27 and I loved Paul and I started reading about him and I wouldn't, I didn't want to know how he died you know he doesn't die in the, in the bible you don't know what happens to him and people said oh i can tell you how he died i said i don't want to know i didn't want to know i didn't want to study it and find out because i i didn't I, he, he died by the way and so anyway so i found that out okay and then look at the, number seven is the work of peter and we see peter and he takes leadership and here's the guy that denied jesus christ three times and we saw a couple of weeks ago where jesus said do you love me peter yes do you love me peter yes do you love me peter three times he said peter feed my sheep and we see his leadership on the day of Pentecost in the first part of the book. We see Paul's missionary journeys three different times taking the message to the world. And he goes to all these places and he goes in and, and there are people who believe in Christ and then there are people who are against him and they beat him up and they stone him and they kill him. And you can read sometimes in Second Corinthians all the things that he went through. Incredible. We'll see it as we go through the book of Acts. And then there's this council at Jerusalem. And let me tell you why that's so important. At the very beginning of the church, if you remember, there's Jews and Gentiles, and most of the church is Jewish, but then the message begins to go to Gentiles, and they begin to believe in Jesus. And then some people say, well, wait a minute. If you're going to become a Christian, you're going to have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. In other words, you better keep the law if you're going to be saved. And the big issue came up, are you saved by faith or are you saved by law? And in Acts chapter 15, they met together, and they stood up and said, it's faith alone in Christ. At the very beginning, there's always confusion. Let me ask you something. We can go out these doors. We can talk to people all over the place. And we say to them, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? And very few people are going to say, faith alone in Christ. They're going to say, well, you've got to repent of your sins. You've got to give your life to Jesus. You've got to work hard. You've got to go to church. You've got to give money. You've got to get bad. I mean, they've got all this junk that has been thrown in there. See? And so even at the early part of the church, there was issues. What must a person do to be saved? Then, we'll see, after Paul's three missionary journeys, he goes to Rome, and we see his defense before kings. He stands, and three different times he defends himself and the message of Christ before the leaders of the world. He ends up going to Caesar, the leader of the whole world. And he, this is how the book ends. Paul's in prison, 
waiting to see Caesar. So there's some incredible events. Now, there's two things to remember as we go through the book, okay? The central message of the book of Acts is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's their message. People say, what's our message? Jesus died on the cross, paid for sin, and... What is it? Rose again. The message is the death and resurrection of Christ. Every time we go through a message in the book of Acts, you're going to see somewhere in that message they say, and Jesus rose from the grave because we serve a living Savior. Jesus is alive. He is alive today. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He actually lives inside of you, as does the Holy Spirit, as does the Father. So if you're wondering about him, Jesus is alive. And that's the message. The central message of the book of Acts is the death is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the second thing to remember about the book, it has no proper ending. It just ends with Paul in prison. And the reason it doesn't have an ending is because what's going on in the book of Acts doesn't end. They were telling the message of Christ to those around him. We have exactly the same message. That's why the book doesn't end. It doesn't have a proper ending because we're still carrying this thing on. We're still the book of Acts. We're still telling people about Jesus Christ. And so it's a powerful thing. As we think about the book, there's... um, uh, is it another slide? We're going to see the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ministry of the apostles, Peter and Paul, that's the key, and then the spread of the gospel, the good news. It's amazing. Let me show you a, a, a sort of a big outline of the book, okay? Let's see how this fits together. It begins with chapters 1 through 7 and their ministry in Jerusalem. And we're going to see the first part of the book, it started next week, the coming of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see how they've, they, they, Jesus left, they come back to Jerusalem, And they all get in a room, about 120 people, and they pray. And they're waiting for the promise. The promise is the Holy Spirit. And they're waiting for God to send the Holy Spirit. They only have to wait 10 days. Jesus died and rose again, walked on the earth 40 days, ascended to heaven. 10 days later, 50 days after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit came. So they waited 10 days in Jerusalem, praying in a group. And we're going to see who the group is. And by the way, Jesus' mother is in that group, and when it lists her, that's the last time she's mentioned in the Scripture in this passage. So we'll see the coming of the Spirit. We'll see the opposition to the church. I think this should encourage us because if you stand for Christ now, there's going to be opposition to you. Now let me tell you this. You can get opposition in two ways. One, when you stand for Christ in a fallen world and that you live differently and you have this message of grace and you tell people that Jesus died and rose again and the only way to heaven is through him, there are going to be people mad at you. When you say Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, there's a whole bunch of people mad at you because they think there's all kind of ways to God and, there's all kind, and everybody's going eventually because everybody's sweet. Just, it doesn't matter who it is, everybody's going. And so when you stand for Christ, there are going to be people against you. Now there's a second thing. That's the unbelieving moral that's against you. You're going to have a whole bunch of Christians against you because you're going to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no one of the Father except through him. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And there's a whole bunch of people who are Christians who will say, that's wrong. That's not enough. You're not asking people to do the right things to be saved. And so you're going to have opposition in a lot of places in a lot of ways. So when you see, when we see chapters 3, 4, and 5 and the opposition and what happens, it'll, we should be stronger. We should say, listen, we, we know there are going to be people opposed. Who, who were the people opposed to Jesus the most? It was the religious leaders. Who's going to be the people opposed? Listen, most of the world don't even care what we believe. And, and let me tell you, I, I, I did some study on this. We think that the unbelieving world doesn't want to hear our message. They do. If you look at the studies, about 80% of everybody you talk to, talking about the unbelieving world, will listen to you. There's only a few, there's there's about 15 to 20% of the people who are closed-minded enough that if you said, would you like to talk about spiritual things, could I talk to you? About 20% of the people say, I don't want to hear anything. 80% of the people will go, well, yeah, you have an opportunity to spread the message of Jesus Christ. When you look at Stephen's address, it is amazing, chapter 6 and 7. And as I said a while ago, if you, if you want to get the whole Old Testament put together in one chapter, it's right there when Stephen uh, tells his message. And they end up killing him. They kill him because he stood for Jesus Christ. Well, we get upset because somebody gives us a bad look, right? And, and they killed him. So that's in Jerusalem. And it, the persecution came, and they began to scatter people out. And we see the ministry of Philip. 
And I love this. I love this because Philip, uh, he, he's, he's an evangelist. That's what he's called, the evangelist. He just tells everybody about Jesus. And, and the Holy Spirit is active in this book. And the Holy Spirit says, go, go to this desert place. This desert place is called Gaza. You've heard of Gaza when you hear about what's going on in Israel today and the Gaza Strip and, and the East, West Bank and all of these things. The Gaza Strip is where, uh, it's, that's where the Palestinians are today. He went to Gaza, and, and the Holy Spirit told him just to wait there. And he was standing there, and this caravan comes by, and this Ethiopian eunuch has, has gone to Jerusalem to worship, not the living God, but to worship. And he's coming by, and he's reading Isaiah and the Holy Spirit tells Philip, go over there by the chariot and talk to this guy. And Philip goes over and goes, hey, do you know what you're reading? The guy goes, how can I know what I'm reading unless somebody tells me? He says, I'll come up there and tell you. And they got up there and he led this guy to Christ. There's so many great things we're going to see. The ministry of Philip, the conversion of Saul, who's called, who was Paul. And I love that life. I love what he did. He never let up for Jesus Christ. He never let up. He said, I have a reason to live. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's Paul. He said, while I'm living, I get to talk about Christ. While I die, I get to be with him. And he wrote to the Philippians and said, I don't know which one's best. I mean, mean, really, I'd like to be with Christ, but I better probably ought to help you. That's what he said. And then we'll see Peter's ministry. Oh, it's so amazing. There was this woman, her name was Dorcas. And she made all these things for people. She was a great Christian woman. And she made these things. I mean, she was just giving it out. And she died. And all these women and people were so sad. And they called Peter and they said, Dorcas died. And he goes there. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, he raises Dorcas from the dead. What a ministry of Peter. Peter takes the message first to Jews, then to Samaritans, and then to the Gentiles. Peter takes it to all three. He starts, he's the one. He goes to Cornelius. And he starts off and says, hey, Cornelius, I'm not supposed to be in your house because the Jew's not supposed to come in the house of a Gentile because y'all are worthless. That's what, that's what the Jews thought of the Gentiles. Peter goes and leads them all to Christ. What a ministry. We ought to be getting excited. We, stay, we go, wow, I wish that was me. Why couldn't I do that? Why can't I do that today? You can. You can lead people to Christ. You can tell them about Jesus. Then, we get to the uttermost part of the earth. And we see Paul going on a missionary journey. He goes to what is modern-day Turkey. I think they've estimated that in modern-day Turkey today, there are less than 50 Christians in the whole country. This is where Paul went on his missionary journeys. There were churches all over the place. So don't tell me Turkey didn't have a chance, okay? It started in Turkey with Paul taking that message to those people. And, and we see him go to the regions of Galatia. And then, he, then they come back to that council at Jerusalem where they had to decide, is the message faith alone in Christ alone or is it something else? And then he goes on another missionary journey. He ends up going to Europe. And then he goes on a third missionary journey. He goes to Europe again, comes back, stops at, at uh, Ephesus. And there's so much happening there. And then they arrest him. And they beat him up. And they put him in jail. And he's in jail for two years in Caesarea, and then he stands and says, I want to go to Caesar, and so the whole rest of the book is him on the way to Caesar, and the big shipwreck at the end, and it's just some great things, and then the book ends. By that time, we ought to kind of be pretty fired up. What do you think? There's so much here. I want you to look at Acts chapter 1 just for a second in verse 8, and I want you to look at that verse, the one that I told you is the key verse. There are four keys in that verse. There is the power, the proclamation, the person, and the place. Let's think first about the power. Look what he says. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The power to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ is the power of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us in this room who know Jesus Christ as Savior, we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. So in the same way that these apostles and men were sent out to take the message into the world, we're sent out to take the message of the world. The second thing is the proclamation. The proclamation is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ all the way through the book of Acts. That's the message. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's our message. When you go out these doors don't mess it up be clear as a bell Jesus died on the cross paid for sin and rose again if you believe in him you have eternal life the third thing is the person and the person that we proclaim is Christ we are witnesses of Jesus Christ 
Salvation is in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. We trust in Jesus for eternal life, so it's powerful. And the last thing is the place. They started in Jerusalem, and they went to Judea and Samaria, which are provinces, and then they went to the end of the earth. The same thing for us. We start right where we are. We start right here. We start in this community. We start with our next door neighbors. We start with the people we work with. We start with the people we play with. We start with the people we, we, we do activities with and all these things, and then we begin to spread it out. And we begin to try to get the message to the world. But we start right here. It's amazing. So the goal, that you'll dig the book. You'll study the book. You'll, you'll take this little outline. You'll start reading it. You'll study it. Now, you know, there's, if, you, uh, if you read uh, like four chapters a day, which seems like a lot, and it is a little bit, you could read the book of Acts every week. Now, it's narrative, and some of it's a little bit long, but it's actually pretty fun if you just sit down and said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take about 20 to 30 minutes a day, and I'm just going to read four chapters a day so that every week I have read the entire book. Well, by the time we get through with this study, you'll have read it like a million times, right? And just, so just think about it. You'll put this tremendous Word of God in your mind. And you'll see how it fits together. So that when we're in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3, you can say, hey, I know what's going to happen way over there. You could say, Paul, don't go. Don't go. You don't know what's going to happen in chapter 18. You know. So there's some great things. The next slide. The two key people that stand out, Peter and Paul. He's the apostle to the Jews. Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Peter went to all three at the beginning, but he was set apart by God to take the message to the Jewish people, and he was incredible. Paul was set apart by God to take the message to the Gentiles. On the road to Damascus, when Paul trusted Christ, God actually told him, I'm going to turn you, Paul. I'm going to take you, and you will be a light to the Gentiles. You will turn them from darkness to light, from death to life. So Paul was that apostle. So Acts begins with simple truth that Jesus is alive, that he's at the right hand of the throne of the Father, that the Holy Spirit's coming, and we're going to spread the message. That's the book of Acts. Let's look at verse 1. We'll get verse 1 and 2. We'll go very, very quickly. We will not go into detail. We'll get that more next time. Notice how it starts out. It says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. He talks about the first account. The first account is the Gospel of Luke, the ministry, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. The second account, which he's writing, is the book of Acts, which carries on after Luke's Gospel. So he writes to this man named Theophilus. And he writes to this man. We don't know anything about him. In Luke, he's called Most Excellent Theophilus, which was usually a title of someone who had a major position somewhere. He's probably a Roman with the name Theophilus. Theophilus means lover of God or friend of God. It could be either one. He was some somehow connected with Luke. We have no other record of it than the Gospel of Luke and in this book. And we don't know who the man is, but he's giving information. He wrote to Theophilus and said, here's what Jesus did. Then he wrote to Theophilus and said, this is how the message spread. He said, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Remember? We have what Jesus did. Go ahead to the next slide. What Jesus did. That's his miracles and signs. What did he teach? Remember, he said, I'm the statements, I'm the truth. He ate the truths about resurrection and death and all of these things, the return and reign. So he said, I wrote the first things about what Jesus did and what he taught. And that's the thing. And we just got through with the gospel of, of John. And what we saw was what Jesus did. That was the seven signs. And what Jesus said, that was the seven I am's. And so they're right there. And so it's powerful. And then notice. He says, I wrote about what Jesus did until the day, this is verse 2, until the day when he was taken up to heaven. That's the ascension. He is at the right hand of the Father. Now, you understand? If you believe the Bible, and I do, and I know you do, you believe the Bible, Jesus left this earth in a human body and went out of sight into the clouds and disappeared. Scripture tells us that right now, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father. God the Father. There's a throne somewhere, and Jesus is sitting by the Father. 
That's what it says. He is our intercessor and advocate. Because see, we say, what is Jesus doing now? We know what Jesus did. He died on the cross, paid for our sins. We know Jesus is going to come back someday and rule and reign. What's he doing right now? He is our intercessor and our advocate. Hebrews 7.25 says he lives forever to make intercession for us. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says, my little children don't sin. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. So when we need to pray, we pray and Jesus is the intercessor for us. We say something like, Dear Heavenly Father, would you please do this? In Jesus' name we pray. We don't say in Jesus' name we pray to tell you the prayer is over. We say in Jesus' name we pray because He is the authority. We approach the living God. He is our intercessor. So when we offer a prayer request to God, we go through Jesus because He's the way, the truth, and the life. But He's also our advocate, which literally means defense attorney. When we sin... He is there, and we can confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Why? Because we have the defense attorney, Jesus. And so anytime Satan challenges you, anytime Satan maligns you, anytime Satan says, J.B.'s a bad sinner, and he's right, Jesus stands up as my advocate and says, He is, but I've already taken care of it. You have a defense attorney that's taking care of everything, seated at the right hand of the Father. He is preparing a place for us. Remember in John 14, he said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it wasn't that way, I told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I get it ready, I will come back for you. He's coming again. He's coming again. We started a study in Sunday school on the end times, and we talk about the first coming of Christ. He came to the earth to die on the cross. Second coming of Christ, he comes to rule and reign. He comes in between in the clouds what we call the rapture, and he is coming, and it could be any second. You realize Jesus Christ could come in the clouds right now. I mean, don't look around and say, okay, let's see, i got a lot of stuff I really need to do before Jesus comes. Uh, he could come any second, so you better get on the stick if you think there's stuff you need to do before he comes because he could come at any second and take us out. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come get you. Notice what it says, until the day that he was taken to heaven, after he, by the Holy Spirit, had given orders to the apostles. What was his orders? Are you ready? Here they are. Stay in Jerusalem. Why? Because you've got to get the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't go do the ministry unless you have God's power. It's the same truth for us. We say, hey, we're supposed to go out into this world and lead people to Christ and talk about all this stuff. But you can't do that in your power. We can do, apart from him, we can do what? Absolutely nothing. In Christ, we can do all things. So we got to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, we don't have to wait. We got the Holy Spirit the moment we believe. They had to wait. The Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. That was the promise. So he said, stay in Jerusalem to get the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the second thing he told him, I want you to be witnesses worldwide. I want you to start right where you are, and I want you to spread out, and I want you to go to the end of the earth. Notice it says, until the day he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. He picked these men out to be his representatives. An apostle is one sent forth with authority. We are not apostles. We are ambassadors. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech through us. We're not apostles. We don't have that same authority. We have the word of God, which is the authority, but we're not the authority. They were. And we'll see it as we go through the book. It's an amazing letter. It's an amazing book. History. But it's exciting. We see in the background. We're seeing written by Luke. We're seeing Luke is telling his friend what happened. And he's saying that here's what Jesus did after he ascended and what happened. Amazing thing. Let me give you some applications to think about. Very simple applications. First, study, study the book of Acts. Do your own study. Read it. Dig it. it you know, it, it's, uh, there's some hard things. What, what I want you to do is this. As you read it, mark some areas that appear to you to be hard. You, could, you know, I don't know what's hap- going in here. What, what is happening here? Why did this happen? Write them down. Study them in depth. You can call me and say, what's going on in chapter 14? I may say to you, I don't know, I haven't got to there. No, I have, I, and, but... but <laughs> I've read the whole thing and studied the whole thing. But anyway, we're going to look at it a little bit. But, a little, but as you study it, you may say, wow, I, I'm anxious to see how this fits. So study the book. And pretty soon as you read it and study it, it'll begin to flow together. And you'll see how it works. The second thing is let's be faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ. That's our role. 
That's our role. In the same way that these people were set apart to go into, this, into their world with the message of Christ, we're set apart to go into our world with the message. We have the power, Holy Spirit. We have the message, the death and resurrection of Christ and faith in Him. We have the place. We start here and we spread out. As we continue through the book of Acts, as a brand new church, let's proclaim Jesus Christ to our generation. 